Good morning. It's a pretty windy day here today. Um, the bees may be a little fussy because of the wind, but we've got a swarm to check that Cedar helped out with some eggs last week because we weren't sure if it was queenless or not. And I'm here with the lovely Ariel from our customer service team who kind of a beginning beekeeper, but not really anymore, right? You're, yeah, on the cusp. On yeah, the cusp. on the cusp. <laughs> Maybe been into it a year with you. Yeah. So yeah, getting there, always and, learning. <laughs> and uh, Ariel started off with a nuke, which she put into her flow hive, but then rescued a box broken on the side of the road, fell off the back of a truck. Yeah. Literally did. <laughs> rogue hive, <laughs> and um, both are doing really well, so yeah. that's cool. <laughs> so she's had to um, get in and pull apart all that and fix it all up, so that mm. that's a big lesson in beekeeping straight away. But to, So today we're doing beginner question and answer, so please, if you've got any questions, whatever they are, type them into the comment box and we'll do our best to answer them. Trace will call them out for us. So we'll get into this hive and check it out. So the origin of this hive was a swarm that, I forget who caught it, maybe Cedar caught it. And then I checked it a couple of weeks later and it was queenless. And so I put a frame with eggs in there and then Cedar checked it after that on a live and found queen cells that had been chewed out, um, but couldn't find the virgin queen. So we need to check back and see if we've got a virgin queen or if the eggs that Cedar helped this hive out with um, have turned into a couple of queen cells. So Ariel, I might just get you to do it. We'll put our hoods on first sure. before we crack the hive. Um, please wear your bee suit if you're a beginner. And um, as I said, it's a bit windy today, so the bees might be a little fussy. The wind tends to blow them around a little bit. Mm. All right. Alrighty. Yeah. Have you got a hive tool there? Yeah. Cool. So the bees can stick the inner cover together pretty good. So Ariel's just going around in every corner and popping it free. Well, straight away I can see the population is looking really quite good. Mm. Yeah, and nice that, and full. that's the first sign of a fairly healthy colony and Ariel's going to look for the queen underneath this inner cover. Mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. if we had a super on this hive, then with a queen excluder in between the brood box and the super, the queen is not likely to be under the inner cover. Mm. But because it's just a single brood box, she might be there. I can't mm -hmm. spot her, can I you? I can't see her either, no. So when you're doing this, you can either just shake the bees into the brood box or you can lean it up against the hive out of the way somewhere. Cool. If you do lean it against the entrance, mm. just be mindful that the bees coming back will be really confused oh, and yeah. they'll fly around going, what's going on here? Oh, so, but it's totally fine. Sure. But well, maybe on the side. Is that the yeah. See them all going in? Yeah, I see. Alrighty, so Alrighty. we'll move these, if we can ever get the smoker going. That's all right. We'll move these up, back down. So I've got a 10 frame at home actually, and I'm finding it a bit daunting because there's so many bees. Mm. And because it's so tight, what do you recommend in you know getting the frames out when they're this tight? Well, the thing with the Flow Hive 2 Mm. 10 frame yeah. or 7 frame as we call it, yeah. um, 10 brood frames is compatible with 7 flow frames in the super, mm. is that these boxes, these flow hive 2 boxes are a little bit oversized so they do actually have a little bit more room than the standard oh, Langstroth boxes okay. so you can see there's a little more, a little bit more room. wiggle room. Mm -hmm. But um, usually the, the thing that I do is just use my J tool mm. and go for a frame that's not connected so this one's connected oh, yeah, I see. in here mm -hmm. if it is connected you can cut it yep. but it is daunting there's lots of bees you can just go into a middle frame and pull it mm -hmm. up too true that might be easier cool give it a go i just move this so i can stand in here mm -hmm. 
and you can really go into any frame first. It does matter how you put them back though because the bees like to keep their brood usually in the middle of the nest, not always, but usually. So you usually want to put them back in the same order that you got them out. Lovely, nice and slow. So straight away I can see lots of cat brood on that frame, but I don't know whether that's the frame that Cedar has put in last week or not, so we'll have to keep looking and see what we find. So you want to get the sun over your shoulder. We're looking for eggs? We're looking for eggs, that's it. Alright. You just seen capped brood so far? Capped brood, some young brood. Oh, so some larva? Some young larva. Or well, larvae, isn't larvae. it? Larvae. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hard to see, but maybe no eggs so far. What, you know. What's on the other side? Again, just a little bit of cat brood. And yeah, so far I can't. Oh, I might not be. This may be the frame that Cedar put in, perhaps. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, I don't think I can see any eggs in this one so far. So we just lean him up against the side of the hive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like that? Yeah, with new wax. Yeah. Not so, um, yeah. not so tilted because it can really yeah. wiggle out. So. Yeah, sure. So try and do it as straight. Yeah, oh, quite cool. straight. So maybe against the side. The yeah. Okay. Cool. I just do it like that, but mm -hmm. yeah, cool. People do it the other way as well. Mm -hmm. There's also a way you can use your harvesting brackets. You back a couple of screws out here, and you put your harvesting brackets on, mm. and use that as a frame hanger. Mm -hmm. so it's a little tip that Cedar likes to do. Yeah, I love that. Alright, next one. Yep. If you do have any questions, please put them in the comments. We're doing beginner question and answer today. So we'd love to hear from you. We'll try and answer them as best we can. Are there any questions, Trace? Yeah, Pete. Um, we've got Patrick from Southern Highlands down in New South Wales. Just wondering, added a second brood box um, last week, but have now noticed that the honey in the super has drastically reduced. What are the bees doing? They might be eating your honey in your super to um, either draw the wax in your new brood box or to store down there for themselves, or they may just be hungry. Um, so you may want to check your brood box and see what they're doing, check your population. Um, and was there a reason for adding the second brood? What was the reason? I assume for swarm control. Um, with the Flow Super too, it can be an easy way to manage swarming by um, actually harvesting honey. It gives the bees more room straight away. So that could be the answer. It's always, it's always a bit of second guessing when you're beekeeping trying to figure out what they're doing, but if your honey's reduced, generally they're probably eating. What you can do is pull out your flow frame, and if your flow frame has a dry section like that, the um, cluster of bees has moved up and started eating that section. So that's a telltale sign. Now I'm just seeing just lots of cat brood again, but all worker brood. And then I'm not sure, a little bit of cat honey on the top. No eggs? I don't think so, but look, I will admit, I'm not an expert at always spotting them. <laughs> but um, I don't think so, so far. Mmm. Might keep looking, see yeah. if we can find the queen in here. Yeah. I think it's fixing to rain pretty soon. <laughs> I don't know if the bees will like that. No, we'll have to close the hive up. I can see very young larvae and eggs here, so. Oh, you see some eggs? Yeah. Oh, great, there you go. I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but in this area here. So I think we may have a queen in here. I'll try and find her. What do you think? We 
keep going through the middle. Yeah, sure. Let's see if right. she's here. Let's do it. I'll grab that one. Mm -hmm. Do you want to grab the next one? Right. Hey, Charlie's saying lave is pronounced la vie. La vie. There la you vie. go. Say la vie. Hey, la vie. <laughs> There's always lots of opinions in beekeeping, isn't there? And, oh. and in the English language too. <laughs> so many opinions. That's what I like about beekeeping. There's lots of different solutions and questions and lots of different ways to do everything. Definitely. Yeah. Lots of drone comb on this one. Mm, I can see, see a drone. Lots of eggs. Oh, that wind's blowing that frame. Mm. So I can see some eggs in here. It might be easy to see in this section. Hey, so, Ariel, as a new beekeeper, yeah. and you're doing it um, without gloves on, does yes. that, is that what you prefer? Do you feel really safe? Is it like... Yeah, yeah, I think well, it's nice in the beginning when you're unsure or you're not like feeling that comfortable around the bees. But mainly it's just um, for starters, I feel like you can be more careful and therefore you may not, you know, be squishing as many bees or your gloves get in the way or something like that. But mainly I think it's just come with being comfortable and then also, you know, I kind of find it convenient as well. Yeah, great. It's a, it's a really great point that Ariel makes that when you're wearing gloves, it's actually more difficult to be careful than mm. it is when you've just got your fingers. So you do end up accidentally squashing bees here and there, mm. more so than with your fingers. You actually, when you don't have gloves, you are trying to be more careful and more gentle so your fingers don't go in the wrong places. Mm. But having said that, if you are a beginner and you're not necessarily comfortable around bees, Please wear your gloves. Nice. So yeah. I'm, I'm satisfied that there's a queen in this hive. Yeah. We've got a few more splits to check. Yeah, sure, great. So maybe we'll move along. Pop this last frame in. Mm -hmm. Same location. Uh, I think it went here, didn't okay, it? Okay, yeah, cool, you're right, it did. When I say put your frame back in the same spot, it doesn't really matter as long as your brood frame goes with the other brood frames because the reason is the bees want to keep it warm or cool depending on the temperature outside and so if they're out on the edge without the other brood frames the bees that are trying to do that are actually split and so you've split the brood nest up you want to keep that together to let them be able to do that efficiently and effectively Lovely. Bam. Nice. Hey, Heaven Chip, Chip are tuning in from England. Hello. And they're wondering how far apart is best between the hives. Oh, yeah. That's a good question too, actually. They can be really close together, actually. Um, commercial beekeepers tend to keep them on a four-way or a six-way pallet where they're just squashed into a little sort of box-like configuration where they're actually touching up against each other and the entrances are all facing different ways. Um, and that's just for easy loading for the commercial beekeepers. But we like to just keep a little bit of working room between our hives, so it's probably about a metre. Um, a good one too is that you can get your mower between them, so that's always nice. <laughs> Yeah, and also being able to access the windows, isn't it, on the flow? That's right, hives, yeah. You know, being able to look through them. And That's a great point, actually. I've got a, a couple of flow hives at my place that are all jammed together, and I can't get in the windows, which is, you know, a little bit annoying. Yeah. They're all on a stand together. Hey, Pete, now you've got that smoker going, and um, we've got a question. Any tips on how to keep your smoker going for longer than 20 minutes? Well, <laughs> it's funny you should ask, because yeah. mine's not really going very well. <laughs> Um, what, I, what I do is, I didn't like this very well, but I just roll up strips of cardboard that are that wide into a cardboard tube, like that, and then I light the bottom and put it down in there. 
and then that lasts for maybe 20 minutes. And um, then I've got pine needles over here just to shove on top when it starts going out. And you can tell it's going out by the smoke. The smoke starts getting really hot. And you can just shove whatever you want on top and it's already going, so you just shove it in there and keep puffing it and it should be, should be right. So just have more fuel, puff it while you're jamming it in there. That's what I do, but there's lots of different ways to do it. Some people do it all at once. I hope that helps. So we're just going over here to our splits. It's getting really windy now. I actually can't see any bees flying here. I see one, there's one. All right, do you want to get into this one area? I'll yep. take the roof off. Yeah. So these are little splits that I made. Actually, they were a few weeks ago now. Um, most of them had queen cells. Wow, that's really small. I think that was a swarm actually, that oh, yeah. cedar court. Mm -hmm. No queen there. <laughs> that might have been the one that we were talking about before actually. Mm -hmm. You might have mistaken the, oh, yeah. mistaken the two. Oh yeah, this is the case. So I put a frame of honey in for them, which they've eaten. Mm. See, it's quite dry. They may need a boost, these guys. That's some comb that they've drawn. Looks dry, doesn't look like there's anything in there. The population looks really low. Only nectar in these cells. So you've got lots of bees, all these broken queen cells. And this is the actual hive that we were talking about. We must have mistaken it for that one. So you think there's a queen in here? I guess that's what we've got to find. Because mm. I think last week Cedar tried to find her but couldn't quite. Oh, wow. So mm. our photographer Callum says we've put this one in, or well, Cedar put that one in with eggs last week. And now we're checking for queen cells. So lots of nectar coming in still. Just touching them to move them out of the way. You can also blow on them. Just want to see what's beneath them on the, in the cells. Make sure you've got your veil on when you blow on them. Just having a really quick look here. There's some big fresh queen cells. So obviously queen cells that they made, the virgin queen that's emerged from the old ones never made it back to the colony. And so Cedar's put this frame in with eggs and they've started drawing cells. So if you've never seen queen cells, that's what they look like. If they're emergency cells, meaning there's no queen, usually the bees will draw it out off the side of the frame. If they're swarm cells, usually, but not always, the bees will draw it around the edges of the frame, up the side and along the bottom. And this one's not capped, so you can look up and see the lava inside. And these bees need a boost, so we might give them a frame with some capped brood if we find it in our other hives that we're going to check. So just a quick check in there. We'll um, pull the frame out, empty one, and that can be ready. Ready for us to come back. We'll just leave that as is. Jump into the next one. I'll get you to do this one, Ariel, since I took that over. <laughs> hey, Pete, no, you know you mentioned you mentioned about the gap between, do you have to smoke your bees before you'd mow between the hives? Um, yeah, it could be a good idea to do that. You don't have to. Um, it depends on your bees too. Some bees don't mind the mower. Some bees hate the brush cutter. Some bees don't mind the brush cutter and hate the mower. Some bees <laughs> hate it all. And some bees won't even care. You can go up and ram their hive with the mower and they won't do anything. But um, it's always a good idea to be really careful when you're mowing and brush cutting around your hive. Best idea is to do it in your bee suit. It's a little bit of a hassle, but 
the best way to prevent getting stung because they really don't like it. The, um, they tend to tolerate battery electric equipment more so than petrol equipment because it's much quieter. But if you're brush cutting around your hive and you're spraying stuff in the entrance, they will not like it at all. Sort of like your neighbours really, isn't it? Basically, yeah. <laughs> that Sunday morning lawnmower. Exactly. <laughs> So Charlie's saying too uses natural fibre hessian um, in his smoker to make it burn longer and says it's better for your lungs. Great idea. Yeah. Definitely better than cardboard. <laughs> yeah, great idea Charlie. Um, anybody else with smoker tips please put them in the comments. So we're basically looking again for a queen in here. You can see the bees hanging on down there. Lots of pollen in this frame. I see lots of pollen on this side too. So the pollen is the bee's protein source and they'll eat it and it stimulates the young bees to produce royal jelly for the um, for the for the larvae. Mm. <laughs> La yeah, well now we've had a few people saying larvae is the English sort of one there and larvae is the American English oh, one. Oh, there you go. So I wonder what the Aussie one is. <laughs> larvae, mate. Love, it's just love. It's dove, mate. <laughs> so we're looking for queen, huh? Yeah, we're looking for eggs. We made these splits a little while back and they had queen cells in them, so we need to make sure those virgins have mated and come back and started laying eggs. And if they haven't, we'll give them some more eggs. So the timing on brood is from day of egg laying, day one, a bee is in the cell as a larvae or a larvae or a larva. <laughs> for seven to eight days then it's capped and then it emerges on day 21. So three weeks and these bees under the cappings will emerge. And so you can usually kind of tell from that time frame what's going on in your colony. Mm. And we see a lot of these bees have emerged already and we want to see eggs down these cells but I don't think there is, mm. but we'll have a look in a sec. And there's the bees have stashed some nectar in there, used it as nectar storage. What are you seeing on that side? Yeah, just lots of, um, lots of empty cells really, mm. and a little bit of cap free brood, not much. So that can be a sign that your hive is queenless, but mm. you might need to you might need to stack multiple signs onto that sign just to make sure that it is, that it's not necessarily so. I am seeing some young bugger on my We're all confused now. <laughs> a larva is a, single, a singular and larvae or larvae is plural. <laughs> Hey Pete, Cameron's asking, do you need to put wax on the flow frames for the bees to take to the flow frames? No, you don't. The, it really depends on the colony as to how quickly they take to the frames and how strong they are and how strong the nectar flow is in your area at the time. If you, you definitely don't need to paint the, the frames with wax. The bees will go up there. They do have a lot of work to do before they can start filling those frames. So. Um, They'll be starting that out in the middle of your super and you may not necessarily see bees through the windows on the sides. So you might think, oh, they're not up there. But actually, if you pulled some um, flow frames out, you may see bees in the middle starting to wax up the gaps and wax, wax over the frames, getting them ready to fill with honey. Um, a good tip 
which I've said a few times before on here is if they're not going up into the flow super, just take some of this burk home that's on your brood frames, just scrape it off with your hive tool. Just grab it, grab a handful of it and just jam it into the side of your flow frame like that. Just jam it straight into the comb. The bees will go up there and say, hey, this is not supposed to be here and they'll clean it all up and shift it out and in that process it'll move them up and get them working the super. <clears throat> hey, um, Chuck's just tuned and he's one of our ambassadors and maybe this is a bit of a thing for a lot of people. We've just switched here to daylight saving and so Chuck's saying, have we changed the time for our Facebook Live? But we haven't. The time's changed here. We didn't even think of that, yes. We didn't even think of that, uh -huh. yeah. Yes, that's right. So thanks Chuck, thanks, but Chuck. no, we haven't. We've just gone forward an hour. So our curtains don't fade or something exactly. like that, isn't it? So have you seen eggs yet, Ariel? Not yet, but it is a bit dark and I am seeing lots of young larvae, lava, lava, lava. <laughs> lava, lava, lava. <laughs> lots of cat brood on this one as well, so. Lots of grubs in here. Mm. So these grubs are under eight days old because they're not capped. Mm. So we can kind of assume, because I don't think I've checked this colony for a while, that um, we do have a queen. I haven't seen eggs yet, I might just have a look on this next frame. Well, this is all brood sized cells. Sorry, this is all drone brood sized cells. The larger cells, apart from this tiny little patch here. So the bigger size cells in here, all drone brood size. Smaller down in this section. I can see, I can see eggs down there. So down in here, quite hard to spot probably. Always difficult through your veil <laughs> to spot the eggs. Hey Pete, that might be a good good frame. Just Laurie's asking, actually, maybe I should grab that other one. Wondering about our brood frames, do mm. we use preformed like wax foundation or do we just use basically the little the little comb guide and let the bees do it themselves? Yeah, great question. Thanks, yeah. Callum. Callum's just handed me oh, good one. an empty one that we just pulled out of this hive ready for some eggs and brood. Um, so we do use blank frames like this. You can use foundation in your frames, which is a, um, a kind of pre-rolled pre sheet of wax with little hexagons on it. The bees will draw that out that way. They'll draw their cells off that sheet. But if you use a blank frame, the bees will draw their comb that way. They'll hang it off like that. And you can see in this frame how they've done that you can see a, a bit of a stitch mark down here. So the bees have started here, kept drawing, started here, and stitched those two pieces together. Lots of the times the bees will just do this and they'll keep drawing downwards and stitch those pieces together as they go. And that enables the bees to draw whatever size cell they want. So obviously in this frame, like I said before, they've drawn large drone sized cells because they wanted to produce more drones at the time. It may have been spring when they drew this. It's fairly new comb, so it might even have been a couple of weeks or months maybe ago. And um, they've drawn the smaller size worker brood cells in this section. Um, using these blank frames is much less work for you as a beekeeper because all you do is hammer this little starter strip in and glue it in and the bees will just do their thing. So both have advantages and disadvantages. Mm, and it's so exciting watching them draw it naturally as well. It is, isn't it? It's, it's pretty so cool. cool. <laughs> well, um, I've seen a bunch of eggs in this frame. All right. And you've seen some eggs. Are we still looking for the queen? Or? Well, we've got two frames to go. Let's yeah. look for her and see if we can spot her real quick. Nice. Hey, just um, asking, um, what oil do we use in the, the ant caps for oh, yeah, the flow hives? It's just cheap veggie oil. 
um, yeah, no point using your expensive olive oil or anything like that, just cheap veggie oil. And um, that just deters the ants, makes a little moat for them. And you can use that in your pest tray too, on your flow hive too. And that'll trap the hive beetles. Lots of nectar in this side frame. It's lots and lots of it. So if you do see, if you do see this uncapped liquid nectar, you know that it's coming in right now, in the last week or so. And um, that tells you that the bees are working something, and if you're seeing a lot of it, then they're working something that's quite a good source for them. And that can tell you, along with um, a lot of brood, or a lot of eggs, or um, a lot of pollen, can tell you what's going on in your beehive, but also outside. No queen No, we, we haven't spotted her? No. That's all right, we've seen some eggs. And that's okay. You know she's there. No. Was that the side frame? Yeah, well, yeah no, right. this one. Yeah, I got to shimmy it over. Yep. It's getting strong. <laughs> it is. It's getting pretty windy up here. Hey, how long do our workers and drones live for? So the workers live for, as an adult bee, they live for about six weeks. First three weeks of that is spent inside the hive doing inside jobs. And um, then after they get old, which is over three weeks old, they go out and become field bees and just forage all day. And then they generally work themselves to death after about three weeks of foraging. So if you include the larval stage, then nine weeks all up. Apparently the drones can live for a couple of months. I'm not exactly sure on the time frame of that. I've heard five weeks and I've heard two months and um, I know that um, if they do mate with a queen, which is what we think is their only job, then they die. But apart from that, they keep coming back and flying out every day to their drone congregation area. Now having said that, in really cold climates, worker bees can actually live for a couple of months. So gearing into winter, those bees that are going to go into winter are bigger and fatter and they cluster, they don't fly out of the hive. They're clustered in the cold and they're using their body warmth to keep that cluster warm. And they'll live the whole winter. But we don't get a winter here, so. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> so our bees are just living for six weeks. So we'll get these guys out. Mm -hmm. um, and put the, put the roof on. Nice. These are just, um, there's no finish on these hives, is there, Pete? It's just, they're just the natural cedar. That's right. They were um, a very quick build just to make splits and swarm catch in swarm catchers and um, we'll finish them later and make them look nice and but um, they were basically a stop gap for spring management but the red cedar western red cedar wood is super durable untreated and unpainted and you can see just up here it goes a cool silvery sort of color and they last for years and years and years and years like that my my dad's house is clad with Western red cedar, untreated and unfinished, and it's still fine after 45 years. So it's a very um, durable timber in the weather. So we'll move across to this hive. All right. Hey, yeah. Chuck's also obviously people are aware of the Varroa mite situation. Um, that's kind of happening here in Australia and just wanting to check in and I guess people really need to probably keep our, in touch with that with the DPI, is that what you would think Pete? Or that's right, the DPI is the Department, the Department of Primary, Primary Industries, yeah. it's the New South Wales Agricultural Govern Governing Body, I think, it's, I think that's right, um, that's just in New South Wales and people that are in New South Wales need to keep track of that and be very vigilant. Um, so 
So the DPI here in New South Wales requires beekeepers to alcohol wash every 16 weeks and report their alcohol wash online. So we're looking for a queen in this colony. Lots of pollen underneath. I think we want to find some brood too, don't we, for that other colony, so. Yeah, definitely. What have we got here? Okay, I can see some grubs in here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So lots of grubs down here, might be hard to see for the camera, I'm not sure. So if we're going to put a new frame into that um, smaller colony, mm -hmm. how do we, won't the bees you know, fight or yeah. they, you know, swap it around. They do apparently fight, but mm. I've never really had any problems with it. They sort of seem to just get used to it. I just smoke them a lot yeah, just to sure. try and mask the smells a bit. I just yeah, sure. I just kind of roll with it. Mm -hmm. um, you got a queen cup. Is that a queen cup there? It is, yeah. So you can look down and see if there's anything inside if you see one of these. And another one over here. If you don't see anything and it's just a little sort of smooth dip, then it's just a little insurance policy. If the bees want to replace the current queen, they'll herd her around and make her lay in that. And that's an easy way to draw, for them to draw a queen cell. Otherwise they've got to chew an existing cell out. They've got to widen out the cell walls around an existing tiny little larva, larva and um, do it that way. So I doubt we're going to find any capped brood in here because the queen's probably very new, a large cell size. We might put this frame out on the edge because we'll put our drones in on the edge and they may fill it with honey instead. Just leave it out of our middle of our brood nest. I can't see anything through my veil at the moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit harder. With the dark comb as well. Dark comb and no well. sun, mm. yeah. I can just see eggs down there. So when you're, you want to give them cap root, not just eggs? Yeah, because... It's quick. <laughs> yeah. So they've got some queen cells there already that they've built. We don't necessarily want them to build anymore. It might slow them the whole process down a little bit. Sure. Um, capped brood, the best thing would be is emerging brood, which where oh. you look for bees poking their head or chewing out mm. of the capping, just about to emerge. Cool. And then they're gonna pop out straight away and fill that hive with more population. So we may just leave that aside. We could pop that in. Or oh, all just nectar. Nice one. Ariel's got a great eye. Oh. That was a quick spot. It's nice and golden. She is, isn't she? Mm. She's a lovely colour. Mm. Great job, Ariel. So you're not a beginner anymore, <laughs> right? Officially. <laughs> so you can see. If you are a beginner at spotting the queen, I'll just guide her around so she doesn't go around the other side. Just how different she is from the drones, which a drone right there next to her on my finger. Much fatter, but a round abdomen, whereas the queen has a long abdomen and her wings don't go all the way down to the end of her abdomen like the workers do. She's sticking her head down cells checking them out um, sometimes it's a bit of a bit misleading to look for the color because sometimes queens are stripy sometimes they're not this one's not sometimes they've got like a kind of mottled color towards the back of their abdomen usually they've got a shiny thorax which is the black part behind the head but not always 
Most of the time, you can tell by the way she walks. Isn't that a song? <laughs> <laughs> it's the Bee Gees. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, so we've seen her, I'm satisfied with that. So we know she's on this frame, we can put this frame into our weak hive over here. We'll keep all the bees on, we want to boost the population. If they fight a bit, they fight a bit. There's no queen for them to kill or anything like that, so they will do what they do. You can see the bees holding on to each other. Pretty funny little sight. Just put that right in the center. You can do this and watch what they do. You can stand here and watch them, but it takes them a while to even realize what's going on before they even do anything. You can see they're sort of Checking each other out. <laughs> a little bit confused what's going on. But, um, all right, I might put the lid on that. Do you mind grabbing the roof, Ariel? Yeah. Thank you. So we'll put our blank frame in here. We could put it in the middle. Um, it sort of depends what's going on with the season as to where you want to put this. If you put it in the middle, in the middle of the brood nest, it's going to split the brood nest in half again and make a space in between. So those bees trying to keep that brood warm or cool are split. So you may not want to do that. You can do that in really bumper conditions and when the hive's quite full, it's not so much of a big deal. But we might just put it second in here. Hopefully they don't, don't draw drone comb. The chances of them drawing brood comb in the middle are greater than out on the edge. Out on the edge they may draw um, honeycomb or, or drone comb. I just saw a frame that they're currently drawing as well, Couldn't, just to illustrate what I was talking about before. They've just started this little patch of comb here. I was just talking about using foundation or not. Did you get the stinger out? Oh, it didn't sting. Oh, good. Yeah, I just missed it. <laughs> so you can see it's, it's built a little bit twisted. So in a week or two, we might need to come back and just straighten it out. You can just twist it out, buried sort of slowly. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't come undone. Yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. You see how they're building out quite thickly. Uh, I don't know, this comb's kind of coming out past mm. the bar. Yep. Is that going to squish bees? Is that something you should try and correct because they've built out past that? Yeah, that's a great question because it can be a problem for you when you're moving frames around. When you generally, when they're drawing all the frames at once, like when you catch a swarm, if they draw wonky, they'll draw with bee space in mind. So they'll, the next frame they would draw like that, yeah, sure. around that hump. But if you're putting this frame somewhere else, then yeah, it can squish bees and make a spot where the bees can't access and hive beetle can get in here in our area. Hive beetle are quite a problem. Um, this is very hard to correct. Yeah. It's full of nectar. Mm. But what you can do if you really want to do that is shake all the bees off and just cut that comb with your hive tool flat. Mm -hmm. Generally in this little honey area up here, so the brood generally in a, it's in a rainbow pattern here and then they store honey up above like that, um, they all make the cells taller to store more honey. And maybe as a beekeeper, we don't want that because we want all our frames to be even. So yeah, you can take a knife or your hive tool and cut it flat 
and the bees will then just cap it. You will have a big mess of honey though. Um, however, the bees will clean that up if there are enough bees in your colony to do that. I wouldn't recommend it if the colony is small. You'll create all kinds of problems. Pete, that's um, Greg's just tuned in and, and um, question is kind of what you were just talking about. Is it also necessary to clean the burr comb off the top of the frame like that one you were just looking at? Um, and then can the bees reuse it if you just drop it back into the brood box? Is that what you should do with it? The bees can reuse it. Um, sometimes they won't. They'll just sort of propolize it to the bottom of the bottom board. Um, a lot of the time they will come and collect it a little bit. Probably the best way to deal with it is if you do want to scrape it off, I recommend just collecting it in a ball, chuck it in your freezer in a container and when you've got enough, melt it down. If you don't have you know, dedicated wax melting equipment and you've only got a little ball of wax or say that size, I recommend a double boiler just using a can, so a, you know, an old tomato tin or something in a saucepan of water. Um, boil that saucepan of water and stick the can with wax in it and the, um, the wax will melt in the can and you won't ruin your saucepans. Because anything that gets wax on it in your kitchen, it's um, pretty much over for that, <laughs> over for that utensil. So you, then you can just chuck the can away, or recycle it I should say. Um, nice. But in regards to scraping this off, you don't have to, the bees will probably just build it back, but sometimes it just gets too much. Like, say this, if we put this inner cover on, it may not quite, yeah, it's kind of rocking on that, so we might want to scrape it off. You just smoke all the bees out of the way, and we'll just scrape it off, and when you do it, there's usually lots of bees in it, just sort of give it a shake, and make sure when you go to squish it up that there's no bees in it, because you can get stung. I don't know how I know that. <laughs> yeah, I would have never thought of that. <laughs> yeah. Don't ask me how I know it. And just put it in a ball and get a bigger and bigger ball. Having said that, if you do have a super and a queen excluder on, those that burr comb can they can build um, a bridge with comb up between your excluder up sorry up through your excluder between your brood frames and your flow frames. And then your, your super's really hard to pull off and your excluder's all stuck. And so it can be a good idea to clean all that up when you put it back together. But then they'll just build it all again anyway. So, you know, it's just one of those things. It's like doing the washing up. <laughs> just have to do it again next time. <laughs> hey Pete, this is a good one. Now I remember you did this on some hives. Leanne was asking, have you ever heard of the burning of the outside of the hive, the shoe suki barn, which, um, yeah. is a technique to preserve timber by burning. But didn't you do that, Pete, on some hives? Yeah, we yeah. did. We did do that quite a while ago. Yeah. And it was a great look. Yeah. And it really did the trick. Yeah. So, yeah, I would recommend it. Um, just be really careful that you don't, obviously, burn it too much. Um, what's, what she's referring to is getting a blowtorch and quickly sort of, you sort of singe the outside of the timber. Um, and it blackens and seals the timber. And you can actually see this panel here has been laser cut. And that's the type of finish that blowtorching the outside of your hive will do. And it actually seals the timber quite effectively and it looks really good for bees. So once again, we're looking for a queen in here. I'll grab the first frame out, Ariel, if you want to do the next one. If you've got any questions, please put them in the comments below. Trace will Pull them out. We're looking for a, a queen in our splits. I can't see any eggs in here. So it's usually the side frames is going to have pollen, some nectar, maybe some capped honey. Um, this one's got a lot of pollen. You can see the different colors here. Lots of different colors tells us that the bees are on a, bit, a varied diet, which is great. They, they need variation in their diet, just like we do and they'll actually bring that pollen in, they'll drop it in the cell and another bee will come along and pack it down with its head and then they'll mix it with a little bit of saliva and some honey and then put some more in and that 
little mix will ferment into something we call bee bread. It just makes it more easy for the bees to digest. What are you seeing on that frame, Ariel? Same thing, lots of pollen, and then also cap honey up here. Great. Any, um, any new nectar, open nectar? Yeah, open nectar for sure. Great. Definitely, all of the above. Yeah, just lots of stores. I'll put this side frame down. Mm -hmm. That's a bad position for it, actually. Do you want to go into the next one? Going for it, absolutely. Nice. Hey, um, Heaven Chipper, I've got another question asking. You know how the hive tilts three degrees um, towards the back? What does that mean in height difference between the front and the back? Oh, I don't know. It's that not would, much, is it? That would make me have to do maths. And yeah. <laughs> can't do it. Um, I don't actually know the answer to that. It's not much, no. Um, but you could actually, I do this quite a lot because I don't necessarily have in my own yard. Um, tilted bottom boards. I sometimes I just have normal Langstroth bottom boards, and I have a Flow Super on top. And all I do is just pick up the front of my hive and and put a piece of timber underneath it, just to chock it back like that. And um, as long as the hive's tilted back, it's the honey's going to run out, and it works fine. So. Um, yeah, I was thinking about the foot blocks, Pete, that we put on our um, That's right, yeah. our hives. They're probably, God. They're 18, 18 mil, actually, 18 mil. Yeah, right, okay. I don't know what that is in inch, inches, but. Yeah. Yeah, 18 mil thick, I believe. Well, there you go. Oh, I'm getting blown away. <laughs> Poor bees. Poor bees. They're very quiet, though. They're that being very nice really today. Nice. They're so quiet. How often do you recommend to check the brood boxes, Pete? I recommend if you're a beginner to get in once a week or once every two weeks. And the reason I say that is because it can become quite overwhelming if you're not experienced and you feel a little bit nervous about it. It can be one of those things that you just don't do and don't do and the nervousness builds up and then it becomes a really big deal. And so I always recommend just to get in there and just have fun and relax and enjoy your bees and just familiarise yourself with what's going on in the colony. And, um, but in general, I would say once a month is great. Less in winter, depending on your winter. Um, more in spring, depending on your spring. More in times of high forage. And, um, well, I guess, just keep an eye on them in terms of, in, in times of low forage, you may need to feed. They can go downhill quite quickly, but having said that, they can just be fine um, for really, really long periods as well. So it's a great idea to check them every month and more if you want to. Um, some people believe you can go into the hive too much and disturb your bees. I don't really believe that very much. I think going in there is fine um, and the bees just are cool with it but it's really up to you but I recommend every month at least. Great. So, Paul, um, I've just seen some eggs on this frame. Fantastic. Ooh. So that means we have a queen, a queen. which is really good. So we're only queenless colony is that little tiny swarm and that's getting rectified with some queen cells in there. So this split's actually really pumping and we could probably super this split. So I might come back and do that later today. As you can tell by all the population, lots of bees. The new nectar's coming in. Ariel's found eggs, so they've got a laying queen. And in a couple of weeks, this population will grow a lot as those new eggs turn into larvae and pupa or pupae, pupae, <laughs> what are we calling them? And then they, uh, they pupate and then emerge. <laughs> Is there any larvae larvae in there? Larvae, larvae, larvae? <laughs> larvae, larvae, larvae. <laughs> 
Hey, Paul, you're um, just checking in about uh, flow hives available outside Australia. They sure are, Paul. Um, check the website honeyflow.com and if your country is not there or you need some info, just contact our fabulous customer support team um, at info at honeyflow.com and they'll let you know whether they can ship hives to you. We try and ship them wherever we can, um, obviously, if, if we're able to. So info at honeyflow.com. Thanks, Paul. And um, Jessica's asking, Pete, their hive is really aggressive and attacks us as soon as they approach the hive. They've been suggested to re-queen. What do you think is the best solution? I think, I think probably that's a great idea. I think um, if the bees are continually stinging you, then re-queening is the option. Um, I generally give hives a couple of chances because they can have, bees can have bad days and um, out of conditions can affect their mood. And um, so what I usually do is, if they're real fussy one day and sting me, then um, I just make a note of it. Some people put a little thumbtack or push pin in them or right on the lid. Um, then if they're aggressive the next time, you know, depends how many chances you want to give them. But if they're, if they're aggressive a second or third time, then you know, okay, they weren't just having a bad day and requeening is the option. So to do that, you want to keep, sorry, to do that, you want to get in touch with uh, a reputable queen breeder in your area, hopefully. Um, having said that, breeders can post queens in the mail. So order your queen. Don't do anything until you've got her in your hand. Um, you can keep her overnight in a cool sort of warm place put a little bit of water on her cage she'll come in a cage like this it'll have a little candy plug in here and she'll have five or six attendants with her in this little cage once you have her in your hand put her in the cupboard <laughs> and go in and find your queen in your colony um, and kill her somehow. Um, I just generally squash them. Uh, it sounds brutal, but it's just what you want to do as a beekeeper. You need gentle stock. Then you wait. Uh, if you do that in the early morning, you can requeen in the afternoon. So if you, if you go and find your queen in the morning, eight o'clock, something like that, um, squash her, close your beehive up, leave them alone, go in at three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, and pop your queen in. I'll just demonstrate quickly. Pop your queen in like this so that the candy plug is upwards towards the sky but tilting downwards like that. So the reason for that is if the hive gets hot, the candy can melt. And if it melts that way, oh sorry, if, if it's that way, a bee can die. One of the attendants might die and block that hole. Um, if it's up that, way, up that way and the candy melts, it'll melt down on the queen. So put it down that way, like that, and the candy will melt outwards. Generally that doesn't happen, it's just a little precaution. But the bees from your hive will eat that candy out over a day or two, and by the time they do that, they'll be used to that new queen's smell, and they should accept her. So you just, whoops, you just put it in like that, in between your frames and squish it together. Close your hive up and leave it alone for a week and then come back and check for eggs. Hopefully your queen will be marked already. That's always nice and she's easy to find when you go back. Now they say there's only about a 75 to 80% success rate with that. Sometimes the bees, your hive, just will not like that queen and they'll actually kill her anyway. Um, and so then you have to do the whole process again in which case you've got to go through and knock out all your queen cells that they've built. I um, hope that helps. <laughs> so we haven't found the queen in here, but Ariel's seen some eggs. Uh, where was that frame? It was somewhere in here. The eggs? Oh no, this frame that I pulled out. Sit down beekeeping. <laughs> nice and relaxing. <laughs> and that was the side frame, wasn't it? This one. Yep. Do you want to?
trying to scoot those over. Sorry, Ariel, I'll, I'll smoke them out of here. So I'm just using the smoker to move bees so we don't try and jam them between these bars here. Okay, go for it. Are there any more questions, Trace? Sorry, just sorting out a few things over here. Very busy. <laughs> yeah, a couple of people asking that, this hive that you're checking now, was this a swarm or a split? This was a split, and ah. this split was a conglomeration of a few hives. So my kind of experimental way of keeping swarming down and keeping our bee yard to a minimum of hives was to split two or three frames from each hive into one box and most of them had queen cells because a lot of them were about to swarm and I was trying to prevent that from happening and so these splits were really strong they had heaps and heaps of bees and already had queen cells and as you can see it's got them going really quickly as long as that mated queen comes back sorry as long as that queen the virgin queen comes back mated and starts laying then we're good to go and you can see from the population here that it's probably ready to super as it's spring it's um a good bet that we can super that you can see down you can see down on the back here that these bees are fanning they've got their abdomens in the air and they're fanning their wings and when when you see that happening they're actually fanning a pheromone called nazanov that's telling the bees, the forager bees, to come back. We're here, come back and stay, something's going on. You'll actually see that when you catch a swarm too. They're saying, this is home, everybody come, come back here. So, when you've got a box this full, how do you get the lid back on? Yeah, good question. <laughs> That's your job, Ariel? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, see you later, Ariel. <laughs> Um, just use a lot of smoke. Oh, where's that bee brush? <laughs> so I just, if you do this with your hive tool, just make sure your tool contacts the box the whole time. And then we can smoke them all down. So do you reckon that one's ready for a super, Pete? Yeah, I do. It's pretty crowded, yeah, isn't it? It is. I think I'll come back and super it today. Yeah. So you can see the, what difference the smoke makes when you're trying to get the lid back on. Nice one. Oh, and nice work. If you've got your gloves or you're comfortable around bees, you can just gently flick them into the air and they're fine. And quickly get that on. Oh, teamwork. <laughs> always helps with two people <laughs> but having said that you will just squish bees accidentally here and there don't worry about it too much keeping bees unfortunately you squish them once in a while are there any more questions Trace? Yeah look here's a, here's a lucky last one from Heaven Chip who have been tuning in from England um, does it matter how high the brood box is above the ground? Oh yeah that's a great point actually yeah it, it sort of doesn't but it sort of does because um, in Australia on the north coast of New South Wales where we are we have a couple of land-based predators that eat bees and um, one of them is a cane toad which actually comes up if the hive is close to the ground it'll knock on the hive in the dark and eat the bees as they fly out another one is a, a lizard that can stick its neck up and, and eat bees um, most countries have some sort of bee predator that can get the bees if they're on the ground, the hives on the ground. Um, so it can be good just to get them up off the ground. That's why in the Flow Hive 2 that hive stand is a really, really great addition because you can get it quite high out of the way of, of predators. Um, having said that, you can build little stands for your hive to get them at a nicer working height. If you do want to stack up your supers, then having a stand that's a little bit high can be a bit hard to lift boxes off so you just want to monitor that i find like shin level or knee level is a good height for a stand and then your super's sort of up here somewhere um, you don't want to be lifting boxes too much from a high spot but yeah it is good to get them up off the ground having said that 
commercial beekeepers, like I said earlier on, they have their hives on pallets and they just dump them straight on the ground and that's fine. So it all depends on your area as usual with beekeeping and what you want to do and what you want to achieve. But yeah, I recommend the hive stand on the Flow Hive too. It's got so many great features that really solve quite a few problems. It's getting really windy out here, so I think we might um, wrap it up. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks Ariel for your amazing queen spotting and beekeeping. And uh, 